Suffering for Christ. When we serve our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully, we should expect difficult challenges that may at times create intense times of persecution. Here's Gene to explain this principle. Paul went on in the letter, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, Timothy. And this is not the first time he used this phrase. If you go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 8, when he was talking about not being ashamed, he says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in his suffering. Same basic concept or word or phrase. Share in his suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Now, the interesting thing is that suffering was really the norm for the Apostle Paul. He was called to suffer in ways that most of us are not. In fact, if you go back to Acts 9, verse 15, when he came to Christ on the Damascus road, and Ananias, who was in Damascus, was afraid to meet with Paul because he heard that he was a, a murderer, and he was. But the Lord said to him, that is to Ananias, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles. And a little later in this letter, you're going to see that Paul was faithful to that commitment to carry the name of Jesus before Gentiles right up to the end. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. I will certainly show him how much he must suffer for my name. And he did. God did. He suffered. Paul suffered probably more than any missionary that's ever lived. Beaten, stoned, uh, left for dead. Uh, if you want to read a list of, of uh, brutal things that happened to him, read 2 Corinthians in several places where it talks about being shipwrecked and hungry and uh, just all kinds of things that, that happened to him. And so he was, he was destined for suffering. And one of the reasons he suffered was for us. Or Gentiles. To carry the Word of God to the ends of the earth. So Paul chose him to suffer that we might find Christ. Let's never forget that. Boy, I'm looking forward someday to see Paul. Say thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. The most important thing is to thank Jesus. But Paul suffered that we might come to Christ as well. Now, uh, Jesus made that very clear to the apostles, all of the apostles. They were all unique in this sense because Jesus said, If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. And he was speaking there to the apostles. And they experienced suffering. James, for example, was the first martyr of the, of the apostles. About that time, King Herod cruelly attacked some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, John's brother, with a sword. Later he put uh, Peter in prison. He was going to take his life as well. God preserved him. But later on, we're told through tradition that Peter probably uh, was crucified upside down in Rome. And one of the reasons he was crucified upside down is he didn't feel worthy to be crucified right side up like Jesus. I mean, that's suffering. These men endured incredible suffering to carry out the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here Paul is underscoring with Timothy. Timothy, <laughs> whether you like it or not, you're an associate of mine. I've chosen you. And they've persecuted me, and because they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so he, he addresses this issue with these metaphors. First, the soldier. He says, as a good soldier, he needed to focus on his task. And uh, so he said it this way, to please the recruiter, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of everyday life. Timothy, focus on the task as a good soldier. You're in a battle, an unusual battle. We're all in a battle 
But most of us don't face the kind of battle that Timothy was in. The second metaphor. As an athlete, Paul loved the athletic metaphors. I think he grew up enjoying the games in his hometown, his home city, in Tarsus. Uh, I think he enjoyed the games when he had opportunity in Rome, when it did involve murder and people being killed and slaughtered as it degenerated into. But, but he used those illustrations, he used those metaphors. And uh, he says, uh, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You've got to keep the rules, both in getting prepared, in physical exercise, in discipline, but in running that race. You've got to compete according to the rules. If not, you'll be disqualified. So he uses that as a metaphor to encourage him. He used uh, that metaphor when he... When, uh, uh, I shouldn't say he, because we're not sure who wrote Hebrews, but the author of Hebrews used the athletic metaphor when he says in Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and that large cloud of witnesses are all outlined there in Hebrews chapter 11, all the way from Abraham to David to Joshua and so forth, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight... And there, of course, is the runner. No restrictions. Every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. There he's mixing the metaphor with reality. And the weight is sin that can, can sidetrack us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Keeping our eyes on whom? Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before Him endured a cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Jesus Christ has gone that way before. And Paul, of all people, knew what it was to follow in the train of the sufferings of Jesus. And he said, Timothy, you're following in the same train because of your high and heavenly calling to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to fill the void and the vacuum when I leave this earth. And so Paul is challenging him in relationship to his suffering. There's a third metaphor. As a hard-working farmer, he should be encouraged because he would be rewarded for his efforts. He moves from the soldier to be focused. He uses the athletic metaphor to illustrate discipline and the rules. But he said, remember, that as a hard-working farmer, he should be encouraged because he would be rewarded for his efforts. Specifically, he said, it is the hard-working farmer who ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. And that's what Paul looked forward to. Uh, at the end of this letter, and we'll come to this at the end, but I want to just state it here because it so beautifully illustrates what Paul was talking about there in terms of rewards for faithfulness. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept my eyes on Jesus. It's over. Almost. I have kept the faith. In the future there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved His appearing. And here, as we'll see, this crown of righteousness, I believe, is that salvation which He already had. It will become an eternal reality because he's now with Jesus Christ. And so here's the reflection and, and the response question. Since Paul instructed Timothy in his first letter to have people pray for government leaders so believers can live in peace and tranquility, which he did, and we'll look at that in a moment, how do we reconcile Paul's statement in his second letter that all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, let's look at um, what he wrote in 1 Timothy. We looked at that in our last session uh, in relationship to uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1-4. 
First of all, he said, Then I urge, now this is the first letter, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a, what? Tranquil and quiet life. What is the primary aspect of the will of God for Christians? That we be persecuted? Well, I don't think that reconciles with what we're to pray for. We're to pray for a peaceful environment, a tranquil environment, so we can live a quiet life and godliness, not be persecuted because we're living for the Lord, and dignity, not to be mistreated and treated like criminals, like Paul was being treated. And he says, this is good. This is pleasing God to our, sa our God our Savior. It's pleasing to God our Savior that we can sit here in this room with tranquility. You know, we don't have to be afraid that somebody's out there with machine guns going to blow these windows out or come charging through these doors and blow us away because we're studying the Bible. That pleases God. And we're to pray for that. And why? So that we can just sort of enjoy ourselves and have a wonderful time? No, there's an ultimate goal, bigger goal than our peace of mind. It's that God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in that environment, we can communicate the gospel much more freely, and people are much more open to hearing the gospel in that kind of environment. Now the question is, how do we reconcile that with the fact that everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution. He made that clear. In fact, later he says, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is he thinking prophetically? Um, is he thinking in terms of what's happening at the present time in that situation? Uh, I, I think to answer that question, we, we've got to realize that there are different levels of persecution. And even though we have tranquility and we have freedom and we have a peaceful environment, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to reject us or make fun of us or say things that hurt us or make fun of our children, our lifestyle. That's persecution. It certainly is a, a very low level of persecution compared with what Paul and Timothy were facing and periodically what Christians are facing. But I think there is an element of truth to the fact, well, there's a strong element of truth, obviously, to the fact that if we are not living a godly life, that may explain why we're not being persecuted. In other words, are we really living for God as we should in every aspect of our life? And even within our own environment, if we're doing what God wants us to do, there will be elements of rejection and persecution. So I think those two harmonize if we understand the continuum of persecution. 